Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this APGS webinar on primary angle closure disease. I'm Clement Tam from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm also the Vice President of Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. In these 10 minutes, I'll share with you a logical approach for angle closure management, which is based on angle closure type and mechanisms. These are my financial disclosures and also the funding that has gone into the supporting our research in PACG at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Now, the word primary in primary angle closure disease usually implies that we are not aware of the underlying causes or mechanisms. And so this can be misleading because we are at least aware of several important mechanisms that lead to angle closure in primary angle closure disease. And these include pupil block, plateau iris syndrome, lens-related mechanism, and also possibly choroidal pressures. Now in this graph here, I try to represent uh, in four different eyes the predisposition to angle closure. So the taller the column, the greater is the risk of angle closure and primary angle closure glaucoma. And these different colors represent the different mechanisms leading to angle closure. You can see that in eye number three, plateau iris is the main contributing mechanism, whereas in eye number four, the lens thickness is the main mechanism. So in different eyes, these different mechanisms contribute to different extent. The objective of initial surgery is to remove the greatest chunk or height from the risk column by selecting a procedure or a combination of procedures with the least risk for that particular patient. Now in the next two slides, I'll present to you two hypothetical situations, two extreme scenarios, and go through step-by-step step with you the decision-making. Now in the first slide here, we have 360 degrees complete appositional angle closure. Under these circumstances, if you can widen the drainage angle, chances are that the aqueous can drain through a reopened trabecular meshwork. And so you may not need additional IOP lowering procedures. So if there is cataract extraction, uh, after cataract extraction, if there is persistent appositional angle closure with plateau iris syndrome, then you may consider argon laser peripheral iridoplasty. If there is no visually significant cataract, then you may per perhaps perform laser peripheral iridotomy. And there, if there is still persistent appositional angle closure with ocular hypertension afterwards, then you will have to decide whether it is plateau iris syndrome or the lens being the main mechanism. If it is PIS, you consider argon laser peripheral iridoplasty. And if it is the lens, then you consider lens extraction. In this second hypothetical situation, we have 360 degrees complete senecal angle closure. Under these circumstances, even if you do something to widen the drainage angle, aqueous may still not be able to access the trabecular meshwork because of peripheral anterior senechiae. So in this scenario, if there is visually significant cataract, you may have to consider cataract extraction plus or minus one other IOP lowering procedure as listed below. If there is no visually significant cataract, then you have to decide whether the lens is the predominant mechanism. If the lens is the main mechanism, then you would have to perform clear lens extraction plus or minus one other IOP lowering surgery, depending on the severity of the glaucoma, depending on the IOP control, and also depending on individual patients as well as surgeon factors. If there is no visually significant cataract and the, if the lens is deemed not a significant mechanism, then you may perform just one of these IOP lowering procedures with or without clear lens extraction. Now, how do we decide whether the plateau iris configuration or the lens is the main contributing mechanism in a particular eye? Now, first, let us look at the evidence for plateau iris syndrome. And I think a very important sign is the double hump sign, which you can see at, during dark room gonioscopy. And of course, UBM can also help us delineate the anatomical uh, uh, status in the anterior chamber. Now, this is a darkroom gonioscopy, and you can see that no angle structures is visible after laser peripheral iridotomy. And in this situation, when you apply indentation, the trabecular meshwork is now revealed. And so this is a case of uh, appositional angle closure. 
And with indentation gonioscopy, you will also be able to see what we call a double hump sign. This is the first hump, and then a valley, and then the second hump. The reason for the double hump is because uh, in the peripheral iris, the peripheral iris is draped over a very prominent and anteriorly positioned uh, ciliary body. And then whereas the anterior or more central iris is draped over the anterior surface of a very prominent, very thick and anteriorly positioned lens. Now in an eye with plateau iris syndrome, after laser peripheral erythrotomy, very often you can see the very prominent ciliary processes through the laser erythrotomy. Now with UBM, in the, in the photo above, you can see a very prominent and anteriorly rotated ciliary body, which is pushing the iris towards the cornea, and thereby the drainage angle is very narrow when the eye is in the light uh, uh, situation. Whereas in the dark situation, when the pupil is dilated, the peripheral iris punch up, and in the same eye, in the same segment of the angle, you can see that the narrow angle is now closed off completely by the peripheral iris. Now with plateau iris syndrome, argon laser peripheral iridoplasty is a very effective and safe procedure. In this video here, you can see a low power, long duration and large spot size laser is being applied to the peripheral iris and thereby inducing contraction of the iris stroma. And with this, you can reopen and a positionally close drainage angle. It is very important when you perform ALPI to apply the laser spot to as far peripheral, uh, periphery of the iris as, as you can. Now, what are the evidence for the lens being the main mechanism? I think the most important evidence comes from slit lamp bar microscopic examination, and perhaps the most important of these is the central anterior chamber depth. The central anterior chamber depth is the combined effect of both the, end, the lens thickness as well as the anterior posterior uh, position of the lens. And so this is very revealing. If you have a very shallow central anterior chamber depth, it signifies that the lens is an important mechanism leading to angle closure in that particular eye. Apart from the central ACD, we can also look for what I would call the Mount Fujiyama sign, which is revealed here. You can see that um, the anterior relief of the uh, uh, anatomical structures in the anterior chamber in an eye, when lens is the main mechanism leading to angle closure, the configuration of the iris very much resembles that of a volcano. With the iris draping over the anterior surface of a prominent and thick lens, and the pupil, especially a constricted pupil, looking very much like a crater. When you're looking, from an angle from the side. Now this final slide here uh, shows you the clinical outcomes of performing uh, phacal emulsification in eyes with primary angle closure glaucoma. This is a randomized controlled trial at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. The solid line represents those eyes treated with phacal emulsification alone. You can see that with just phacal, we get a very significant IOP reduction which is well sustained over the course of at least five years after surgery. Whereas with combined phacal trapecolectomy, which is represented by the dotted line, you get an even larger reduction in IOP as well as reduction in the requirement for glaucoma drugs immediately after surgery. And once again, this effect or the difference between the two procedures is well maintained over the course of at least five years. But of course, with combined phacal trapecolectomy, the, the chance and the risk of complications would be, would be significantly higher than with just phacal emulsification alone. So that comes to the end of my very brief lecture today. Thank you very much once again for your time and attention. If you are interested in content such as this, please do be reminded that the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Congress, which is organized by the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society, will be hosted in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia next year in August. So please do mark your calendar and come and join us for more contents on glaucoma. Thank you very much once again.